Okay, uh, well, I'm going to get started. Uh, I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to try and buzz through it as quick as I can. Um, anybody get this reference? Probably not. You're not all. You're not old, uh, old folks like me. This is uh, was a cover of uh, Pink Floyd's "Animals," uh, and my favorite song off that record is uh, is uh, 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 a piece called uh, "Pigs: Three Different Ones." Uh, sort of a famous icon of that of that uh, of that uh, piece. So um, I'm going to follow an uh, cover anatomy of web shells and uh, break them down into basically three different kinds. Um, who am I? Oh, geez, it, you can hardly read that. Okay, that's omenscan at gmail.com. I don't know why that always comes out like that. Every time I change it, it lightens it up. <clears throat> uh, or omenscan on Twitter. Um, I wrote a tool called omens. It's essentially a tool to detect and, and, uh, and mitigate uh, the issues that I'm going to talk about. Uh, you can go over to this website. Tool's free, uh, something I wrote in my spare time. Uh, you can download it. Um, write me emails and tell me how terrible it is. I'm, I'm good with that. Um, right now I'm doing incident response at uh, Live Nation. I've been there for about a month. And uh, prior to that I was uh, 16 years at NASA, uh, architecting and defending high value targets. Uh, I did firewalls, IDS, web filtering, vulnerability management, security plans, incident response. Uh, basically, if it has anything to do with security, I've, I've probably done it. Um, my standard disclaimer, uh, these are my opinions. I might change them. Uh, I might change them at the end of this talk, uh, but they don't uh, reflect the opinions of past, present, or future employers, uh, assuming there will be <laughs> future employers. Um, so to draw some context around what we're going to talk about today, uh, I want to make a, define what a web shell is. Um, probably everybody knows, but, but just to, to make this easy for what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to stay within this definition. Um, a web-based script or program that gives a remote attacker unrestricted access uh, to the host server. So three different kinds that I've encountered, um, and I really haven't found anything that doesn't fit into these three categories. Um, but they may exist. Um, the first one is probably the most common, if you've ever encountered one of these nasties, is the eval uh, type of, of web shell. Uh, this is uh, typically encoded, usually a base64 encoded. Um, the reason it's encoded is to obscure the code and the purpose of the shell. Uh, and typically the input is also encoded. So as uh, traffic comes into this, uh, into this backdoor program, uh, it's typically some form of base64 also. Uh, now, generally, it's, you know, people understand that uh, the reason that is done is to, to confuse your NIDs, uh, your network intrusion detection, uh, for evasion purposes. But what I've found uh, with a bunch of these is that actually the bad guys have figured out that by base64 and for encoding the input, it actually prevents the web server from percent NN encoding it, which makes the input far more stable. So um, when a bad guy is sending a command to the shell, if the, uh, if the web server uh, percent NN, NN encodes it, um, it may, may not run properly, or it wouldn't run properly. Uh, these types of uh, web shells are typically very, very small. I'll show some examples in a minute. And they're typically very, very flexible. They can do um, nearly anything. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Now, uh, this first one is what you'll most commonly see. Uh, I've got dots in the middle there, but, but this will be hundreds, thousands of characters in the middle. This, this shell is, is essentially base64 encoded, uh, rot 13 and then um, gzipped. So what happens is this is dropped on your server. Um, all you see is this, this senseless code uh, that, that doesn't mean anything. But, but what happens is the shell is going to decode it, rot 13 it, it's going to uh, inflate it, and then it's going to eval it. Now, if you're not familiar with eval, there's a lot of different versions of, of eval in a lot of different programming languages. But essentially what eval does is it allows you in, to inject code into the host script. So you have a script. This is the entire script, by the way. Um, and all this does is say, 
I'm going to take this, I'm going to decode it, and then I'm going to run it as if it was this script. Uh, the second type uh, I commonly see is, uh, the, uh, is, is a .NET type. Uh, this is real interesting. Uh, it's evaling something called request.item. That's a, that's a, that's a, a, a program command, uh, a .NET command, to essentially look for the parameter for the, for the variable password in cookies, in the query string or in the post data, uh, and then take that and then run it. Um, and this unsafe parameter you see at the end just essentially says run it in the same security context. Uh, the second kind of script uh, I commonly see is what I call an admin script. Now this is a full featured backdoor. Uh, the first time I ran into one of these things, my comment in the uh, report was that this was no different than someone walking up to a web server, logging onto it, and doing whatever they want on it. Uh, it can upload, download, list, delete files. It can run processes. It can start a command shell. Um, these, are, these are usually very large and complex and typically very interesting programs. The third kind is what I call a, a proxy. Now, I've never seen any public version of this. Um, this is typically nation state. Uh, every time I've run into this, it's been nation state. Um, you can sort of see a, a, a a, a similar example in a, in, a, in a publicly available piece of software called Reda. Um, it's, it's a proxying type of, of, of shell also, but not exactly the same thing. Um, these prop proxies are typically used for exfiltration. So what will happen is a bad guy will drop it on the, on the, on the, the web server, and then that web server is used essentially as a browsing mechanism. So using typically a XML HTTP request, it can be used to basically go through your network as though it were the host. Um, this is used to, to avoid detection, uh, to avoid your, your NIDs. Um, and uh, it's assumed that this machine, this web server, is, is trusted in some way. So uh, it's, it's used as an evasion uh, type of tool. Uh, this is typically a person sitting at a keyboard uh, running this in, in real time. And uh, like I say, it's, it's typically nation state. Um, so why do we care about web shells? They, they don't get a lot of press and they don't get a lot of play. Uh, usually you hear about Trojans and viruses and, and, and all those kinds of nasty malware. But uh, web shells can, can essentially do anything a Trojan can do. Uh, you can think of them as Trojans. Um, they can be written in any and every scripting language. So whatever scripting language you're running on your web server, a web shell could be written. And I've seen them in everything, in, in PHP, in Cold Fusion, in in uh, .NET, in Java. Um, they're really, really hard to detect when they're dormant because they don't actually have any signature on your network. The thing sits, uh, and that they're typically used for a, a persistence mechanism. Uh, so the thing will sit dormant on your network, for, on your server for three months, six months, a year, uh, and it will be called into play when the bad guy wants to reestablish um, reestablish uh, access to the network. Um, I find they're often ignored because most security folks come from the networking side. Um, most security folks don't come from the AppSec side. So um, a lot of times I will get called, uh, someone will send this to me and say, what does this do? Because there, there isn't a lot of understanding on, on how these things work. Uh, web shells are not particularly an AppSec issue per se, but detecting them is similar. So if you have a, a mechanism in place to detect when files change on your web server, uh, you can detect not only the dropping of, uh, of a web shell, but when, say, a programmer puts, uh, changes, a, a, a changes something in the application and hasn't gone through prop proper change control. Uh, so what makes them work? Um, Eval is probably the most common uh, thing that you'll see, but, but there are lots and lots of, of ways that uh, script, uh, scripting languages can inject code into themselves. Uh, I call this self-injection. I don't know what the, what the actual term for this would be, but essentially what this allows, uh, what these types of commands, and every scripting, languages have, ha every scripting language has them, is you can essentially send a program to another program and say, 
okay, host program, run this as if it's you. So, um, and again, eval is probably the most common uh, type of way you'll see this. Uh, also, the thing that you run into is every scripting language I know of will allow you to run host commands, run system commands. So, uh, here's some examples, systems, exec, shell exec, uh, the back tick, process through, uh, here's some .NET types of uh, running, uh, running uh, host command uh, programs, assembly.load, and uh, you see it in Cold Fusion, this uh, CF execute. Um, I want to talk a little bit about web security uh, or the lack thereof. Um, two things that I found interesting as I look at these things is um, this proxying uh, type of, of, of shell that, that I've seen. Um, XML HTTP request is the way this is done. So web shells, uh, or this, uh, spe especially this type of web shell, allows a host to become a client. And so by proxying through the host, um, it's being used as a client. And, and this is a, a really good detection mechanism. If you see a web server on your network that's browsing a network as if it were a client, it's a really good indication um, that, that that server has, has some sort of infection because a server should never be used as a general browsing client. Um, this is, a, again, a used to evade NIDs. And uh, again, these things can lay dormant for, um, for long periods of times and then be called into play when the bad guy wants to reestablish a connection to the network uh, if they've been found out in some other place in the network. Um, this I find very interesting. Same origin policy, which is sort of the basis of a lot of web security. Uh, it doesn't exist for post. So uh, this is what makes detecting these things so difficult. A very small shim on your network can be used to do a lot of things that you don't even, you, you don't have any visibility into. So a bad guy may have an entire system on his, on his, uh, on the attacking system that packages up data, sends it to the web shell, the web shell then executes that. So you have no real visibility into what the bad guy is doing. All you see is this small shim on your server and it makes it very hard, especially when you're doing incident response, uh, to figure out what is the capability that the bad guy has. If you have something on your server that just says, execute everything I get, um, you have no idea what the I get can be. It can be almost anything. So um, most of these functions, uh, especially on the very small web shells, uh, you're sort of guessing what is it the bad guy uh, has on the other end. <clears throat> um, Trojan, uh, web shells can be Trojanized or standalone, so a bad guy can upload a whole web shell to your, to your system or can Trojan an existing application. So you may have, uh, you may detect something going on, you call the application programmer, did you change this program? Uh, no, I didn't change it, I haven't done anything in a month. Well, what has happened is the bad guys got on to the server and actually changed uh, the application itself to have to have uh, this capability inside of it. Um, the other problem you run into is there's lots of open sources on this. I see a lot of these web shells that are um, sort of Frankenstein's of many many different web shells. You can get on Pastebin or Google Code. Bad guy will take bits and pieces of all these different web shells, package them into what he wants to do, and then load it on your server. So uh, finding good signatures uh, can can be challenging for these things because they can change so quickly. They don't have to be compiled. It's, it's, it's a scripting language. So uh, there's no need for the bad guy to compile a thing. He can take a bunch of source code, uh, bits and pieces, put together a shell, and then get it onto your server uh, through ways that I, I won't go through right now. Hopefully I'll be able to uh, talk about that another time. Um, they can be easily customized and modified. Uh, and they're very, very difficult to, 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 to detect using kind of the standard network monitoring systems that, that we have. Um, they remind me of these guys, right? Um, everything looks great, uh, but you've got, this, you've got this thing on your network and, uh, and it's just waiting to happen. Um, I, I worked for uh, Lockheed for seven years. I didn't put that in my, 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 my uh, 
my uh, intro here, but I worked for Lockheed for seven years. I, I worked with them during the time of uh, the F-117 and the F-22. Uh, this was a program called Have Blue. Uh, uh, the F-117 came, came out of a program named Have Blue. And uh, the official word is that Have Blue has no real meaning, but I always took it to mean that Have Blue meant when you looked uh, with radar into the sky, all you had was blue sky. Uh, and it, the web shows remind me of this. Now, the F-117 is built to uh, absorb and deflect radar. Uh, much like a web shell, uh, web shells are designed to blend in. Uh, they use standard functionality, just like any other program on your, uh, any other script on your, in your website. Um, they, existing applications can be trojanized, and they can look like a completely legitimate application. Um, interestingly enough, what came out of the F-117 was the F-22, which was a, a far more advanced uh, aircraft. And the F-22 had uh, avionics in it um, where not only could it deflect radar and look invisible, it could actually project any other airplane into the cockpit, the cockpit of, a, of, a, of an adversary. So if you were going up against an adversary, adversary that had, uh, say, a MiG, uh, you could you could project the F-22 could project the, the the signature of a MIG into into that that adversary's uh, cockpit, um, and again you know it's kind of interesting to me that that, that web shells follow this same kind of idea to blend in and just look like everything else uh, to buy the attacker time. Um, they remind me of this too. I love this picture. Um, just this is what's going on in in your network, and it's very hard to tell that this is really what you're looking for here. Um, how can you detect these things? Um, lots of different ways uh, that aren't typically used. Um, honeypots I, I use a lot to kind of see, well, is a bad guy looking for this kind of, this kind of thing on my network? Um, maybe I have something on my network that I should be, I should be delving deeper into. Uh, log monitoring. This is what Omens does, the software that I wrote. It goes through the logs and it looks for typical signatures of these things, uh, the typical commands that are used inside of them. Um, file integrity scanning, very important. Um, with file integrity uh, monitoring, uh, you don't often see the next step, which is every time a file changes on your system, that that file should be opened and the content should be scanned. Um, not only is it important to know that a file changed, but it's important to know what's inside of it. Uh, and this is what also Omens does. Uh, it, it does file integrity monitoring uh, and it will then, op if it sees a file change, it will open it and scan it for uh, typical uh, hostile content. Uh, WAFs, network monitoring, and NetFlow are uh, all tools that can detect um, this, this type of activity on your network. Again, very difficult. Um, you're looking for evasions, Base64 code um, coming across your network, Base64 code inside. Uh, I mean, how many, how many times are, your, are your, uh, your developers going to have Base64 inside of their code? Uh, so if you're scanning your code, if a file changes, and you're scanning that code for Base64, pretty good, pretty good indicator. Um, if you see, you know, percent n encoded um, traffic coming across the network, and the percent n encoding is is alphanumeric characters, uh, why would anyone want to percent encode regular alphanumeric characters? So these types of evasions are are real good indicators that uh, that this is what's going on in your network. I managed to get through that in 20 minutes. Holy mackerel! Um, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, this is the, the website where you can download Omens at if you're at all interested. If you want to uh, send me a tweet or an email that, uh, that that's the dumbest thing you ever heard in your life, uh, that's, that's cool too. Uh, I'm always open to, to learn more about this.